Hey, everybody, before we get into the podcast, I just want to let you know about our sponsor. It's a film called Sir John A. and the Curse of the Antiquest. It's a fun comedy. It stars John Dunsworth from Trailer Park Boys, Spenny from Kenny vs. Spenny, and the Deaner from Fubar. It's got a lot of other very funny Canadians in it, and you can get it on Vimeo On Demand right now for only $2.99. Check out Curse of the Antiquest. Dot com. All right, next up, if you want to support the podcast, you can go over to our website, Raiders of the Lost Commentary.com. Click on the Amazon banner, either .ca or .com, and it'll take you to Amazon if you're going to buy something. And uh, if you buy something that doesn't cost you anything, kicks us back a little something something, helps support the podcast, and we very much appreciate you doing so. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? Welcome to the Raiders of the Lost Commentary podcast. Welcome. To Jurassic Park. The unofficial commentary for your favorite Get to the chopper! and not so favorite films. The famous comedian Arnold Braunschweiger. Starring your hosts, Adam and Matt. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Start your movie in three, two, Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, This week on the podcast, I have writer-director Giles Alderson, and we're talking about his film, The Dare. Uh, Before we get into it too far, I will say The Dare is available right now on iTunes and Amazon in North America. It'll be coming out in the UK on October 5th. Uh, Giles, how are you today, man? I'm good, buddy. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolute pleasure to be here. It really is. Of course, of course. I'm glad we got to uh, interact a bit. Uh, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Jed Bryan, was raving about your film on, on the internet, and so I obviously had to check it out. And uh, we connected, and, and I checked it out yesterday, and I was thoroughly impressed with it. Um, before Thank we get you. into too much about uh, the film itself, which I have many a question, uh, I was just curious to know uh, a bit of your background in the business, where you got your start, and uh, yeah, just uh, bring me through a bit of that. Yeah, of course. Um, I was an actor for years, and it wasn't easy to get into acting, that's for sure. I mean, I trained at drama school and we did Shakespeare for a bit and toured around with that. And then I went and did musicals for a little bit and was in the West End singing and dancing away. But during that time, I was always writing plays and putting them on at the Royal Court in London or various venues. And um, I just sort of, there was something in the back of my mind that wasn't really right with the acting it was great it was doing my thing and I got to be in some great movies and tv but I think I had this burning desire that I wanted to make my own stuff and create stuff and I was lucky enough to direct a a pilot for a tv series um and I just fell in love with directing so it was kind of 10-15 years into acting suddenly I started directing and it was like wow and it just opened my eyes to how amazing directing can be and how amazing that you can create something out of nothing just some little idea becomes something and that was fascinating for me before as an actor you kind of got your script and you said okay you you vied for the role and you, you worked your ass off when you got it and then you got there and you thought it was all about you you turn up and you're like hey they're setting the lights up for me and they're setting the camera up for me this is amazing <laughs> i'm gonna walk in and say, you know everything happens because i'm here and it's just absolute bullshit and not at all and when when you film make and you start making things, you realize there's so much else goes on. So much, you know, from the catering truck to the makeup artist and the whole team, production team of getting a film made is incredible. And the acting side of it is just the iceberg. But what the people at home see, what we see is the actors on screen. So it's this weird balance where there's so much else going on, but you still have to make that the most important thing on set. So it's no wonder the actors do think that way because they come on set, it's like, talent's here, everyone, get ready, they're going to do their thing, and everyone quiet, they're going to act, you know. So (laughs) There is a bit of coddling, right, with with that. I find like you you can't hurt, well, at least some of them, you can't hurt their feelings too much. You don't want to discourage them too much. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, totally. I, I th- it's really difficult. It's a really fine balance. So I think it helped me coming from the acting background to understand what they were going through to say, ah, I know what's going through their head now. They've got to cry in this scene, especially do it, you know, if you're doing a drama or if you're doing you know, a horror where they're getting screaming and getting pulled apart. That's really hard work. And a lot of directors, producers, filmmakers don't realize how hard it is to do that you try and do that for two minutes in your room on your own now screaming away and pretending you're being chased and oh my god you'll be you'll be done 
So yeah. imagine trying to do that for a whole day. So you've got to think about the actor side of it and how difficult it is. But no, I fell in love with filmmaking and I love being on set. I love being around filmmakers. I love the the experience of it and the the hard work and the the God, yeah. And the fact that someone like yourself can go watch my movie now is just incredible. It's an incredible thing. Yeah, it is neat when you put something out in the world, eh? And then it just, it finds somebody or whatever. Like you put stuff out and then it comes back to you in a way and then you get to talk about it and reminisce about things. I, I get that mm. for sure. So, yeah, uh, but, you're, but you're a filmmaker as well, right? You make you make brand media and ads and, and corporates and stuff. You've made films yourself, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I've done. Yeah, I've done so you not on the hu- uh, as big of a scale as the dare, but... Uh, definitely right there uh, know what you mean but uh mm. so the dare it's a horror film um yeah. what uh, brought you to the horror genre um originally it was I'd, I'd acted in a load of horror films i'd been in a lot um and before i'd been in them i wasn't really a fan i was like oh i like horror films sure but i wasn't a a fan you know like a you know a gore hound or a, yeah. you know the horror family there is so like as as die hard it, horror fans eh like they go to mm-hmm. these conventions and like i, I feel mm-hmm. like i like horror but i'm not like like you said like a horror fan like um i'll watch it and I'll, i enjoy it when i watch it and I, I don't i don't know about you but i don't get scared i find it fun like I find the really? jump. Yeah, I don't know what it, there's some. I think there must be something broken in my brain. Like I, I would be the first guy to die in a horror movie. I'm not scared of the basement. I'm not scared of the creepy sound. I don't. I don't know what it is. Just, just doesn't bother me. I don't know why. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. For I don't me, think I I'm scared. brave either. I just think maybe I'm like I'm stupid. <laughs> I don't know. I think we all react to it in different ways. I was scared shitless as a kid, so I used to shy away from watching them when someone had suggested it. I'd go, oh, no, no, let's watch something else. Because it bothered me. It got under my skin and scared ah. me. And and sometimes it's just our reaction to it. Maybe you find them funny in, uh, in that sense because it's your defense mechanism against That's probably what it is, yeah. And maybe. I mean, maybe not. We all have our different ways of liking things. And people often like horror or the jump scares or whatever because it makes them feel something. It yeah. makes them feel vulnerable, scared, weak, excited. And it's like going on a roller coaster or your fairground attraction, you know. You do it because it makes you <gasps> excited, you know. Yeah. Um, that's why I think horror is so successful. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to make a horror film. I was, I was trying to make a drama before that, but it was so difficult to get a drama made as a first-time filmmaker because people are like, well, you need Jude Law in it. You need Michael Caine in it. Why? And no one's going to give you that opportunity because it's a drama. So I was looking at other options of what I could make, and I was sat here in my loft, and... I looked at my book, which I can't find now, which had a load of ideas in it. And there was two ideas in there. And one was four people trapped in a basement. And the other was old man and a kid in a farmhouse. And we don't know why they're there. And something just hit me. These have been in this book for a while. And so I just went, why don't I put them together? And then within, I don't know, about an hour, I'd pieced the whole story of why it's all interconnected, what the relationships were, why they were there. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my, this, this could be be okay <laughs> i might have something um and then with a lot of tweaking i eventually uh, contacted my writer pal johnny grant and said do you want to write this with me um and we did and within a month we had a you know the first solid script and we sent it out to people but horror was never it wasn't oh i must go make a horror but so many people had said if you make a horror you don't need a big budget you don't need names you can go shoot this in your loft if you <laughs> wanted to I can relate that, to that so much, yeah. It's true because that makes you go, well, that's worth investing my time and money into writing this because I can actually get it made. There's no point writing a big sci-fi, big action set pieces because now you've just spent six months or a year of your life doing that and then pushing it out to everyone. And eventually you become the problem because they might like it, but you're now, you've never directed anything and they're going, well, oh, this is going to be an issue. Yeah. So why not make something for nothing? in your house that's a horror movie that you can do with literally blood sweat and tears um luckily for me though the dare got picked up by a studio and suddenly i'm making it in a, in a much bigger scale than in my loft <laughs> yeah no i i definitely i want to get into a bit of that but yeah just to touch on what you're saying about wanting to do like a drama or, or something like that I, I totally relate to that and like we even did like a small comedy 
here in Canada, it's very Canadian centric. And even with mm-hmm. stars and, and doing like a, a comedy, it's still tough to get people to even want to watch it, um, you yep. know, because it's on a lower budget scale. And, and I do s- the same thing. Like I, I've got like a drama script too, that I feel really good about it. And some mm-hmm. like uh, people I, I, I'm close with uh, in the business that have read it, they really like it too. But it's like, yeah, it's the same thing. Like you either have to get a big cast and spend yep. tons of money there. And then therefore you have to have, like you said, like a bit of a track record so they know they can risk that money on you. Or yeah, you make it with no one, like nobody's, and just hope somebody wants to see it. But that's one in a bajillion that you take a risk on a on a drama with actors you've never heard of. So mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've just got to be so lucky that all the stars align that it is just a massive you know it's a hit it does well and it or one of your stars or one of your actors and it becomes a star you just got to hope and the likelihood of that with a romantic comedy is really small yeah um, it just is whereas a horror you know, like you say there's so many horror fans whereas if it's a romantic comedy who are you targeting is it aimed at plus 30 women you know what i mean age wise or is yeah. it aimed at kids you're just putting it out whereas a horror you're going there's a horror crowd yeah you can target the gore fans or you could target the uh, the ghost what uh, star ones or you can target the you know uh ones like psychological horror it's there there's, yeah there's a market for it so you can target it and you can sell it yourself that way yeah and um, so it's very important to know who your audience is before you set out when you're trying to make a film, who is this audience for this film? And if, there have, if you haven't got one, if there doesn't tick a box, yeah, maybe you shouldn't do it as your first film or your second film or your third film. Really try and target who will be able to watch this movie and start your Facebook groups and your Twitters now targeting them so that they're aware of that. It's, it's a huge marketing machine that when I started off, I never thought I'd, I'd be doing any of this. I never thought I'd be doing the business side. I never thought I'd learn how to raise money and speak to investors and understand the whole business side. And, you know, I've since produced quite a few movies as well. And you, you go, oh, OK, <laughs> that's what you have to do to get your film noticed. You, you do everything. No yeah. one will do it for you. Well, I want to get into all that. So uh, bring me through mm-hmm. what uh, the process of the dare then. So you, you write the script with your writing partner, uh, Johnny Grant. Mm-hmm. And uh, yep. did you guys just want to make it independent at that point? Or did you start shopping around? Or Yeah, because of my acting background and because I'd been trying to make a few movies for a while, I knew quite a lot of producers. I knew people. I'd been sniffing around you know, that indie film world. So I knew enough to send it to a few people to get some feedback. And the feedback was really good. Um, And I thought, okay, maybe we've got something here. And uh, a good friend of mine called Julian Kostoff said, look, I'm starting to produce movies. Uh, Can I take it to a Bulgarian studio who are looking for some stuff at the moment? I said, yeah, of course you can, thinking nothing of it. Um, And I get a report back, you know, a couple of weeks later saying, look, this script's great. We could really shoot it here. Um, But we're not looking to make anything like this right now. So we were quite disappointed by that, but it was great feedback. And in the meantime, we'd found a small investor who wanted to put some money into this film and we were going to make it really low budget. And it was going to be really tough and really hard. And there was going to be so many problems. So just before we were about to sort of sign the deal, we, we went back to the Bulgarian studio and said, listen, We're about to sign a deal here. Here's your last chance. Do you want to change your mind and maybe think about producing this? And I got a call that said, if you fly over to Bulgaria tomorrow, they will meet with you and discuss producing this movie. So I was like, right, book a flight, get on the plane now. This is a chance. And over the time of trying to make movies, I'd learned pitching and being an actor really helped but I also learned what pitch decks should look like I'd learned what my rip reel should look like I'd learned how to sell the film and give it enough passion and say look the film's about you know it's a heartfelt mood dark twisted you know horror movie but it's not a horror movie it's got heart it's about bullying it's about redemption and it's about this guy who you really really shouldn't be rooting for and maybe 
the audience do by the end. And, and I could really get on that level where I was like, okay, hopefully I can just persuade them. With, right, with right. Just me talking about it. And so I flew over and I met the exec producer of the studio in a hotel room, or in a hotel lobby, I should say. It sounded very weird then for a minute. Um, <laughs> and uh, Yeah, he, fly I, to Bulgaria. I, you come yeah, in hotel. We make hotel. movie. I meet you in room. And yes, we make movie here. No, luckily, he uh, he's a fantastic guy. And he, he just said... I pitched into him and I did my best, you know, sat with him, had a laugh with him, which I think is very important. And he said, look, come to the studio with me now, have a look around and let me know if you think you can shoot your movie here. <laughs> I thought, well, I can probably answer that now, but all right, let me have a look yeah. around. I look around this amazing studio. They've got a New York set. I mean, it's stunning. It looks like New York. They've got a UK set. I'm like, okay, this looks like St. Paul's totally. They've got gulags. They've got forest locations. They've got, 16 studios big empty warehouse spaces so i went and met him at the end of the day and he said so um do you think you can shoot your movie here and i went to be honest um yeah i think i can yeah. <laughs> and he said well look bear with me i'm going to be back over in london in a month uh, i'm going to bring my uh fellow producer if you haven't made it with the other company by then, come and pitch it to us again and we'll we'll talk about it. I'm not like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So we're now in the process of moving forward with the other company thinking, oh, then probably not going to say yes, this Bulgarian company. How are we going to, this whole time you're panicked, you're worried. So we kept moving forward and thinking, oh God, okay, you know, a month ticks by. I'm like, okay, luckily we haven't signed anything. We're not moving forward. This guy was being very shady. So we were like, all right, let's, let's play the game so i then went and back and met these execs and I pitched again <laughs> and he still didn't give me the green light but what he did say at the end of the meeting was what you're going to do is you're going to come and prep the film in bulgaria come and be there for three months prep it we'll give you a storyboard artist we'll, we'll sign a deal with you uh, let's let's move forward. And it, it was an amazing feeling. It was just wonderful. But I still didn't have the green light. I didn't have a here's your date, here's when you're making the movie. But I went over to Bulgaria and I was there and I prepped it within an inch of its life and did everything I could to make them say yes, from casting to, uh, you know, doing more storyboards, doing uh, the amount of image packs, doing schedules, everything, going through the budget of how we could actually make this movie and how I, as the director, could make it for them. Uh, and eventually uh, they gave me the green light after three months and said, yeah, OK, you can shoot this movie. Wow. And, and it just changed so much, you know, because they're associated with Millennium Films, who uh, thankfully came on board after they'd seen the movie to sell the movie. And they've done Hellboy and London has fallen yeah. and some Rambo and some huge movies. So to even get the endorsement for them to be distributing the movie in the UK was huge, you know, huge, um, along with the Horror Collective, who came on board after to seeing it at Popcorn Frights at a film festival, but maybe we'll come to that. Um, and just, just yeah, an amazing, amazing whirlwind of, oh my God, is this ever going to happen? Is it really happening? And even on the first day of filming, I still thought any minute now they're just going to turn around and go, yeah, this, I'm going to pull the plug, Giles. This isn't happening. Yeah, man. She's so, so worried. When you got that initial call to fly over to Bulgaria, did you have your pitch deck? and everything ready to go or did you try and throw that something together on a flight or no i had everything i like i say because i'd done this quite a lot i'd pitched this before to so, various okay investors. so you had you were ready to go i was thing. ready to go thankfully because if i wasn't i'd never have done it in time there's too much to do no. to really think about how you're going to shoot the movie your shots your comparables uh your, your potential budgets your potential casts the, the look of your film you've got yeah. to find amazing images and then you've got to do a rip reel now doing a rip reel is very difficult so a rip reel do you mean like a uh, like a uh, sizzle reel like of what it could look like using found footage or yeah okay. i think that it's it's a new hollywood term for some reason that all the execs are saying to me hey do a rip reel and i was like do you mean a, a sizzle reel like right. the director's vision reel and they're going yeah a rip reel and i'm like mm, okay never heard it that so yeah apparently that's the this new is word the new the lingo the I'm learning because what it means is you're ripping from other people's films, I suppose, and yeah. putting them in some sort of semblance that your film could look like this. I mean, really, it's bullshit, really, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's you know, hey, here's the Coen brothers. We're going to make you look like that. Here's Spielberg's movie. We're going to make you look like that. You're right. like, well, 
probably haven't got their budgets, have we? So, but interestingly, the, looking at the movie now from my original rip reel, it's very close in terms of the look, the colors. You know, I show that to my team, my DOP, production design, and you can they can go, oh, I get it, I get what you're going for. So, uh, bring us through making a, a rip reel then, or or sizzle reel for your film, like. Do you watch a bunch of horror movies and like, okay, I'll take this piece from this scene, this piece from that scene? Are you taking dialogue or are you adding your own voiceover? Uh, like, uh, and You can do whatever you want. But yes, with The Dare, I used – I found an amazing – it was a real video that someone – must, they must have been a production company anyway, but it was someone's stag do. And I just took that footage and had that voiceover of them. They were kind of doing dares. So I just took that footage and then I started with that and then I put other images over the top from other horror films like Saw or The Martyrs or uh, The Coen Brothers, uh, whatever tones that I wanted to put in there. It wasn't all horror. And then had this voice on it. And then I'd also use music. I'd use sounds. I'd use jumps, whatever I could to sort of say this is how the film's going to play out. Um, horror, I would definitely say it's easier to do a rip reel on because there's so much and there's so many films out there that people don't know. Whereas if you're trying to do a romantic comedy, it's much harder because a lot of romantic comedies are either very, very well known. So people go, oh, you're making it look like that. Cool. Or they're lower budget and they don't look as good. And you've got to deal with maybe not as good acting or dialogue. It's really difficult to do a romantic comedy rip reel. Whereas with a thriller or a horror, you can just put music over the top and just have images. Um, yeah. With my Arthur and Merlin movie, my historical action, I, I did that. I just put images, beautiful images over the top of a soundtrack uh, because I didn't need to have dialogue. It's quite obvious. Everyone knows what historical action sounds like. You know, you can know what sword, taking a sword's like. Yeah. But yeah, but with with a romantic comedy, it's, it's much harder. Uh, so that's neat. So when they to- told you, come to Bulgaria for three months, start, I guess, pre-production in a way, are they like come here on your own dime or are they like we'll put you up somewhere or? Yeah, they put me up in a hotel and they gave me a bit per diems, but they weren't exactly uh, paying me. Um, so it was, yeah, there was, there was a little bit, you know. It was like break little... even kind of area? Kind of, or... Yeah, not really. You were like, okay, if this doesn't get greenlit soon, I've got to go, <laughs> gotta go home. Yeah. Buy. So, and luckily things were a bit cheaper in Bulgaria and because you were in the studio, you could get subsidized meals and stuff. So yeah, I was, I was, yes, I was in their hands a little bit, but you know, per diems can get you through if you're not spending anything, you're not going out, you're literally just working on your film so you can survive. And to them, it's very little money. So, you know, um, yeah, it was a tough time because it was, you know, you're there on your own pretty much. I mean, I knew Julian came over a few times, but most of the time I'm there on my own with, you know, amazing Bulgarian people. But at the same time, they've got their lives. They go home at the end of the day, whereas I go back to my hotel room and go, all right, what am I going to do here? So I spent a lot of time thinking about the film and watching movies and working out how I could shoot this and why I would shoot it this way and what you know, knowing I might only have a crane for two days or a steady cam for three days ago. Okay, well, which day should I have those on? Where's my special days? Um, how can I work the schedule so the actors are not waiting around in Bulgaria the whole time? All these type of things you're just going through to make the movie the best it could be with the time limit and the budget that they were offering. Um, so it was, a, it was a special time, but also a very difficult time because you thought at any minute they were just going to say, no, we're not going to make this. Yeah, and therefore yeah. you just be devastated. You've put all your whole heart and mind. And that's the other thing. You put your mind into it. And for that to be taken away, it's like losing. It's, it's a loss. It's a huge loss. It's happened to me in the past a few times. And I think I was very wary of that happening again. So I'm sat in my hotel room in Bulgaria going, oh, my God, oh, my God, please don't let this happen again. I'm in love with this film. And I'm, I'm in love with shooting and directing this movie that I haven't done yet. Please don't pull this carpet away from me, please. Um, so I was doing everything I can for them to say yes. <laughs> yeah, it, well, the, I think the other thing that that's rough too is just knowing that one way or another, like if you would have made a mistake, like should have stayed with this original thing, or mm. uh, or just like should I've just tried to make it on my own and then it would have been made. Or but yeah, I mean it worked out for you for you obviously, but I've I've been down the road of just like like okay we're gonna eventually make this thing and then it just it all fills fizzles out and you've wasted like a couple you know almost two years working on something that just never gonna see the light of day so i can yeah, definitely I've share that it. i didn't have to go to bulgaria but 
Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, I spent, God, it's got to be about four years on one project. And I didn't have other projects. What I've learned now is to have more than one, like have three to 10 projects that could actively move forward any day. So most of my days are now filled with, I'll, I'll talk about that project for an hour, then I'll talk about that project. I'll have a Skype call with this team about this project and or I'll be writing another project. Because when I had one, the the hurt it caused me yeah. when something went wrong or it fell down or I'm hearing some information third hand that, you know, someone has now pulled out of your movie. It was devastating. It was heartbreaking and that pain of waiting. So now I don't do that. No, I've got, I can wait. It's fine. We're talking about various projects at the moment, but if that one moves forward that day, great, great, great. I'm all over it. I can jump back into it. No problem. I'm, my head's in the game, but just have more than one because it, it's just a really painful business. No, um, so, I, I tell that to people all the time too. I'm like, it's a business of heartbreak. It's constantly, mm -hmm. you're just, and you have to kind of go through like your day to day or, or move on to the next thing as though nothing had had just happened too right like you can't be like yeah it sucks like uh this thing i put a lot of time and effort into is now uh it's nothing it's it might as well be on fire in a dumpster you know mm -hmm. so absolutely but it's uh, just heartbreaking and it, the other thing is if you're working with someone else to have a contract in place mm. <laughs> then you won't, because if you don't own it that person could take it away from you they could get an option somewhere else or if it's a screenwriter you don't own it it's not yours. And you can spend a year working on this project, you know, doing your rip reels, doing your storyboards, trying to find investors. But years up, the contract's up, they can go somewhere else. It can be devastating. Yeah. So it's that really being said, though, like with the dare and, and, mm. and partnering with this uh, studio in Bulgaria, like uh, I don't know how much specifics you can get into on budget or, or what their deal was, but like. Did you do you still own the rights to that, or is it like pieces are 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 owned by them, pieces are owned by you? Like, what kind of deal did you guys structure? If you're you're able to talk about it, yeah, totally. Most deals like this, they will buy you out. So you're because I was director and, and co-writer, uh, that contract deal that I had in place was yeah, you can buy this out, but I am directing and I am the writer on it with Johnny. We can bring someone else in if we want, but this is the deal. So therefore you negotiate that deal. But and you can retain some rights. You can say, well look, I want theatrical rights as in um theater. So you can put a musical on of the dare if you wanted or you <laughs> might want to own the VHS rights. Uh, because actually VHS of horror movies like this are popular yeah, that they don't want to popular. spend any time doing. Or you might want to do educational rights where you own the rights to put it on at schools or universities so you can go teach and get paid to do some, you know, hey, they watch the dare, now let's talk about how I made it type thing. Yeah, exactly. So you can negotiate all those type of things and it's about you having the balls to do that and understanding your rights and what you own and don't own and luckily I've been doing a podcast about filmmaking and reading all the books uh, during this time about how to make films. Um, I've learned to look at contracts. I've learned how you should uh, look at stuff and make sure you, you know what you're signing. And with the dare, I'd, I'd, I'd been burnt enough times to know, okay, right, what am I getting myself in for? So technically they own it. So there is talk of a sequel, um, even though I get first ref right of refusal to write and direct it. Uh, if they wanted to do a sequel, they'd have to come through me. And we are talking about that. So, yeah, it, they own it. But also at the same time, I still got some rights. Right. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I mean, they, so you like you kind of just got paid to, to make your own movie, essentially, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, that's a pretty good deal. Like, I, I would take that deal, too. Um, and I think a, a lot of stuff you just said is, is very uh, valuable to other people, too, of just the rights you retain and, 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 uh, making sure you, you keep a hold on, on certain things that you want to keep a hold on and reading all the fine print and, um, tell, yeah, yeah I, point. but, but when you're starting out, you know, if someone's offering you this kind of a deal, you, you just take it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, look, learn from it. <laughs> yeah. Because if you start playing too much hardball, they're just going to go, oh, this guy's really, a girl, it's been really difficult. Yeah. You know what? That's, that can't be asked. They, if they're difficult now, imagine what they're like on set or in post or, you know, when they want the film delivered or, you know, distribution. And that's, you know, I've been, 
technically it was four years ago that we started shooting the dare so i've been on this project for six years in total when i first started coming up with the idea and writing it it's a long time yeah that's so a you long know that, po- i, I want to get yeah. into that too but um yeah that's a long totally. time to live to live with something to live with it so, so therefore these producers these execs have to like you enough to go well i'm going to be spending at least two years with this person or at least they'll be emailing me badgering me how bad are they going to be at that and it's something that crosses their minds it's something that crosses my mind when i produce movies for other people now how, how am i going to work with this p- person in yeah. a couple of years, what's going to happen when something goes wrong or just beauty or messes up? Who, who, I've got to deal with this. Are they going to be all right? Yeah. And it's actually really important. I've it's said that important. a lot too, to, to people. Like I, I've worked with people who aren't as good just because I like working them with them. And I've refused to work with people because they're assholes. Like yeah. even if they are good at what they do, I'm like, ah, it's not worth it. Like, you mm-hmm. know, they're just, a, yeah. if they're going to be a dick all this time, it's not worth like you have four years of bullshit from some asshole you know imagine that imagine if i was getting imagine if i didn't get on with my studio or i didn't get on with my co-writer or my stars yeah on my cinematographer though that wouldn't you know be as big an issue because you only technically work with them for the time you're actually shooting the movie and the prep beforehand but imagine falling out with your execs on day one yeah of pre-production That'd oh be my brutal. god they'll just say no to everything you ask for exactly <laughs> So um, you've really got to be careful. So yeah. how much uh, were were the execs in Bulgaria? Were they hands on a lot? Did did they want the their two cents in on a lot of stuff, or did they kind of give you creative reign uh, on like the writing or like on set with directing? Like take me through a bit of that. Yeah, it was it was amazing with the dare. I thought they would be much more hands on. I thought it would be. You know, they'd be over my shoulder watching the monitor all the time. I thought they'd be commenting on the script or how I was directing. And what was amazing is they let me be. They trusted my vision. They trusted what I was going to do. And they were there. They, everyone turned up for the first day and they were all around in the video video village. Um, whereas I like to be on set. I like to be with my actors and my camera. So I wasn't in the video village. I'm running around my little handheld going, right, go here, go here, go here. You know, right. just, just in my element, loving it. So I think they saw that and went, yeah, fine. He knows what he's doing. Let's, uh, let's leave him to it. We'll hear very soon from the crew who all work in the studio. They all know each other. They'll hear if it's, if I'm not doing a good enough job or it's not right or, um, but they also put, a, you know, the whole team was Bulgarian apart from my DP, Andrew Roger. So they knew that, the word gets around very quick just need a radio call or a phone call to you know the offices down there and they'd be like right come over Giles needs some help here so right i knew that i had to be on my game from day one but the whole team worked there you know the, yeah, my line that, producer worked was that difficult my, my, like working with like a, a like the the bulgarian crew like obviously they're on their side and they probably like to do what they like to do but you're coming in you know Telling them what uh, to do well, in a way, or like how? Yeah, no, I think they're used to that because they work with a lot of American crews, you know, and having massive stars like Schwarzenegger and you know Sylvester Stallone there filming all the time. Right. They're used to that kind of world. They're used to big American directors coming over and you know saying what they like, and big American cinematographers saying, uh, "Put me, you know, six big lights over there, and we'll have you know four Ks over there." They they're used to it. What I found was they were so brilliant, so compliant and so no problem. You know, everything was not a problem. It was my 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 only issue was is when they are agreeing with you and you're talking and they're not responding, their nodding of the head is a shake of the head. So if you picture it, you're going. So what I'd like is we're going to have uh, the camera's going to dolly across from here and you're looking at them and they're shaking their head like side to side, like side to side, like, no. That means nah, no, right? Nah. So I, I'm saying, so I'm going to dolly across here and we're going to have the. I'm like, I'm sorry, is everything all right? Is, and they're going, they're literally saying yes as they're shaking their head. That's so it funny. took me a while to get used to shit like that, you know, or they, you know, they <laughs> often don't smile. Uh, so therefore, if you're smiling, it's like, what's wrong with him? You know, so you've, yeah. there's lots of different cultural differences. But I tell you what, they worked really hard. They did what we asked. They understood that we knew what we were doing, I think. And I think they respected that from the off and uh, maybe some didn't i don't know but you know we we had a great relationship i felt with the crew and they all worked really hard and i think that comes from myself and andrew knowing what we wanted and 
relaying that in the best way we could. Yeah. So therefore, they were like, okay, fine. They're not some jokers. They don't need hand holding. We don't need to do this ourselves. But actually, we've got to be on our game. Because that's the other thing. They could just walk through and go, yeah, it's just another movie. It's just a low budget horror movie. We we want to be on the next Expendables. Oh, sod this shit. <laughs> you know, they, they could have. But it was really nice that they they saw what we were doing and saw that we cared and got stuck in and really embraced what we were trying to achieve, which that's is amazing. Great. That's great. And it must have been kind of, I don't know, interesting to, to walk, to fly into another country and there's this entire team sort of ready there and waiting to, to make your movie. That must have been pretty, pretty special. Yeah, it was, though technically they weren't ready and waiting. As such. They were, no, but you know what like, I mean? Like, like they assembled. Them. They were yeah, assembled. Yeah, but, uh, yes. Yeah. Really, that, so uh, it was a special, special thing. How long did you uh, spend on production? Like how many days? Uh, eighteen. Oh, okay. So, so we pretty, had eighteen. Pretty tight. In the movie. Yeah. It's and you're... pretty tight. For uh, I mean, you've seen it. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of gore. There's a lot of hanging people upside down. There's a you know a fair few stunts. You know, stunts people and around the, and, fight. and a lot of uh, makeup and 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 gore mm-hmm. effects like that. I don't know if you want to get into. To that, like, do yeah. you, does Bulgaria have their own special effects team? Or are you using something there? Or are you flying people in from the UK or, or, no. or the US? Yeah. yeah, the only people we flew in uh, was my DP. Um, that was it. Um, everyone else was in Bulgaria. So these, like I said, these teams are amazing. So they'd worked on some big budget movies where they know what an arm looks like when it flies off. They know where <laughs> blood should spray. They know how to make an eyeball. Or, um, you know, or put worms in someone's ear. I mean, okay, I came up with some really weird, crazy things for the dare, myself and Johnny, but um, they embraced it and went, okay, you want you want a mask with a load of insects on it? All right, let's, let's make you one of those. All right, you want an eyeball that comes out of someone's head? Let's make you that. You want a fake, two fake dummies and a load of fake heads of the actors? Let's make them for you. So, uh, yeah, it was just working out in our budget what we could actually afford to do compared to what we it was written originally in the script so some things had to be pared down there was a lot of bigger action set pieces that we had to go well we can't do that you know our lead actor jay played by bart edwards was supposed to fall in a big vat of blood and then there was a fight underwater we just couldn't do it you know it was like we couldn't build anything big enough even though they've got a, a big pool there to make all that blood and then to film underwater it's just a it costs so much more money so there's like, no, you're just going to have to scale it down. All right, we'll just throw him off and he'll land on the floor then. And, <laughs> and then he'll dunk him in it when he lands, you know, on the other side. So it's just compromising the whole time, which is what I think filmmaking is. Yeah. You start off with lofty ideas. We're going to make the next James Bond. We're going to make the next Oscar winner. Yeah. And then it gets whittled down in the script stage because you can't afford that. Then it gets whittled down in pre-production when you definitely can't afford any of that. And it gets whittled down when actors can't horse ride or uh can't <laughs> fight or can't do you see wheels down wheels down wheels down and eventually you, you know you get you, where you compromise so many things and you're still trying to make the best film you can yeah and it's very difficult so many things can go wrong on a film set you I'm have to like adapt and, and 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 think really on your toes a lot i'm, I'm sure um mm-hmm. so I, yeah some one of the things you were just talking about just knowing going to the studio and knowing you have all of the this kind of like playground uh, at your disposable at your disposal in a way like when you went for that three months was it tough to not like obviously you talked about like having to scale back some things but it was also was it tough to like not start rewriting new bits in, into it knowing you have these new locations or knowing you have these new sort of at, like things you at your disposal or yeah no I totally did yeah constantly rewriting so finding a new location you'd be like well this is better but that means i have to rewrite the script because there's no kitchen at that point or there's no outside area here yeah so i was constantly rewriting even in the edit i i didn't stop thinking about making it better it was just it was always about how can we serve the story and make it work and make it right um you know, it was it was constantly that. On set was difficult when you're actually shooting it. Your brain is so full of so much information. You can only really go through what is in front of you now. Yeah. You know what's coming up. 
kind of know what you've shot, but you kind of got to let that go. Yeah. What you've shot is like, well, we shot that. Uh, I've got to move on unless you need to pick up something or you didn't get a, a close up of something. Once it's shot, it's done. You can't go back. You haven't got time. Yeah. So everything's about that day, what you're shooting now, what the problems are of that scene and how to overcome those problems and then shoot that in the best way with the resources and the, the people you have. I totally get that, man. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm jumping all around here, but uh, I did want to talk. Sure, a bit why about, not? Sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I did want to talk a bit about casting and uh, and maybe mm. you can bring me through a bit of what the casting process was like. Obviously, you have uh, a few names like Richard Brake, uh, you know, in there. Mm. Um, was that like something that the Bulgarian studio was like, we need at least one name, one face? Or uh, was it just sort of naturally he just came into casting? Or, uh, it, it's, yeah. a bit, it's a bit of both. I think with a horror movie, like I say, you can get away with having no names. You can totally, totally do it because it's all about the story. You know, on the, the poster for The Dare is a big guy in a mask. We don't know who that is. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's all about selling what that is. And people go and see a horror movie based on a poster or a trailer, but mainly on the poster. They'll click the link and go, that looks fun. I like a guy in a mask. Yeah. Or look at him, he's muscly. Oh, I might watch that rather than, oh, it's got Richard Brake in it or it's got Bart Edwards in it. It doesn't, yeah. oh, okay, the Richard Brake thing means something. People are like, oh, he's a big horror icon. I know he's got Richard Brake in it. I'll watch it for him, see what he's doing again. But most of the time in horror movies, you don't need names. Most horror movies you watch, you don't know who they are. It's, it's you know, they've done movies. They're actors. They're working actors. Um, so the studio were very much like, look, this is the budget you've got. So if you want to have Richard Brake, who costs maybe a bit more than, you know, Mr. Whatever his name is, who's only done a couple of movies, then you're going to have to work that out in the budget and lose something from here, there and everywhere. Okay. I really wanted Richard. Uh, from the very beginning, um, we put out a bit of a spotlight breakdown, which is a casting service here in the UK. And his name came up. And as soon as his name came up, I went, oh, my God, we could get Richard Brake. <laughs> yes. this, is, this is unheard of. For me, it was like, oh, this is fantastic. Um, even though he wasn't necessarily the right size, originally his role of Credence was written as a big man. But as soon as Richard Brake came into my mind, I was like, oh, he'd be so good. You know, he's the star of Batman as Joe Chill in 31. He's been in Kingsman. He's been in, you know, he's uh, in Three so from Hell right? recently. Yeah. Oh, my God. The guy's just, he's, he's one of these legends. So I met him, myself and Julian, sat down and had a conversation with him, and I went, I, I can make this work with him. I don't mind that he's smaller, not as imposing. What he does with his physical uh, mind is better. Yeah, the way he's got he a lot of presence. With his eh? art. Like, his presence. Think, yeah. yeah. So great. So I was like, I want him. And then it was just a case of persuading the studio why I wanted him. But for the other cast, they didn't mind. They were like, no, pick who you want. We'd yeah, rather you yeah. pick Bulgarian people because then we don't have to fly them over. So it's cheaper. Right. I was like, yeah, but I want these people. <laughs> right, I also right. wanted to turn it American rather than British because I feel that it sounds better to me sometimes, horror movies, especially people trapped in a basement and, you know, in a farm house in the middle of nowhere. There's, there's less places in the UK. It's less believable in my mind. And the American market, just it, 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 it can travel further. A movie like this can travel further. Yeah. Um, so the studio was great. They just kind of said, look, get on with it. All right. Here's your budget. Here's the team around you who are going to be reining you in. <laughs> but go make it. Go do it. And that was just liberating and so exciting, but nerve wracking. And sometimes you want someone over your shoulder to tell you you're doing well or you're not doing well. But just to go, OK, no one's saying anything. You know, you've done yeah. your first few shots. No one's saying anything. End of the day comes. No one's saying anything. <laughs> Is I mean, this good? Is this bad? What's happening? But it was, it's it, tough, it, eh? I realized after the time it was great. It was, it was like, this is perfect. I'm free to do what I, I feel like I was meant to do. Do you find just a uh, movie. when you have somebody like Richard Brake on set, like everyone else steps up their game acting wise? Like, oh, we got somebody serious here. Like it's a little, you know. Well, I was, I was with the dare. I was very lucky that all the cast had done a lot of work. So for, for them, 
dead work with some massive actors. Richard Short, who is uh, he's doing, he's working with Denzel Washington at the moment on Macbeth, Joel Cohen's film, and he, you know, he worked with Christian Bale and all these. So for him, it's you know, it's another actor. It's another the same about Edwards, who's in The Witcher, and you know, Sandra Evans. All these people had worked for years. So for them. It's just another actor, if you see what yeah, I mean. Yeah. It's not like it's Sylvester Stallone coming in. So everyone was on the same level in terms of obviously Richard Brake's very well known in the horror world. Um, but I was lucky that all my actors weren't newcomers. They weren't people who hadn't done this before. And the kids that I have in the movie, the young kids who hadn't you know, done much acting before, they didn't know who he was or was as anyway. It didn't matter to them. They were just working out how to act and be and understand what, you know, where to stand on set and stuff. So, no, luckily, it, for me, it was more amazing to have Rich and Break. And it was me that was going, I've got Rich and Break on set today. Yeah. <laughs> how am I going to do this? Yeah. I made sure that my first was shots in- with Rich and Break were very special. Yeah, was, it, was um, it intimidating to work with somebody like that, knowing he's worked with guys like Chris Nolan? <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but I think because, like I said, I'd acted, I've worked with some amazing people myself, and I directed a lot of promos and shorts and uh, documentaries where, where I'd worked with some big people. But it, it's intimidating to direct someone like of that ilk for the first time of course it is and when I direct you know Tom Cruise one day or whatever of course it's going to be intimidating because they might just turn around and go what are you talking about yeah what are you doing no I'm not doing that and that's your worry you always worry that they're going to go what are you talking about I'm not doing that mate yeah but if you have a vision as a director if you have a really strong vision if you know what you're talking about as and even if you don't even if you're saying yeah we're gonna do this shot it's a two shot coming around here or the dolly's here or i'm gonna track him with a crane shot as long as you're confident with that that's fine the actor's going okay i don't care where you're putting the camera you seem to know what you're doing tell me how to you know what you want from me in the scene and again as long as you've got that down to a t how what you want from the scene as long as you don't over direct them And just give them correct notes. And by that, I mean, don't say a load of rubbish after they've they've done their first take or in the rehearsal. Well, the character comes from here in 1969. His father was this, that and the other. It's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything at this moment. That conversation should have happened ages ago. What you need to do is talk about specifics and meaning and thought. What are they thinking? What is the character meaning by that line? And if you can do all that with verbs, you know, uh, some great adjectives, then the actor knows what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, play this with more heart. Give this a lot more, uh, play, uh, pretend you're in love with them. Whatever it is, the actor goes, oh, I can play that. I understand what that means. I can't play my dad was, you know, a fisherman in 1969. Yeah. How do I play that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just being clever about how you are directing and what you actually, what you want to say to them. Yeah, um, um, you being an actor too, I'm sure speaks to that, being able to ha- speak that language to them. But uh, also, I noticed yeah. the you guys, you guys had a lot of child actors in in the film, and uh, they were pretty, mm-hmm. they, they did a really great job. And wondering if you wanted to talk a bit about like an approach of directing child actors, or and uh, even just casting, like if there was a process of casting the the kids. Yeah, we went through quite an extensive casting for this because it's kids it's it's a different beast especially in a horror movie they've got to especially if you need them to be scared or cry you've got to know they can do that on cue every time and i'd seen i'd seen mitchell norman in my friend craig conway who's a producer actor's uh instagram and I'd already cast by this point rob master who plays my big um villain dominic in the movie And I'd seen this picture and I went, oh, my God, he looks just like a younger version that I need for this movie, for the flashbacks. (laughs) And I messaged him and said, mate, is he is he an actor? Is he any good? He said, yeah, he's in my movie right now. And he's amazing. I went, can you do American accent? He went, I don't know. I'll ask him. I said, could you put him on tape? He went, mate, come on, you're taking the piss. I said, please. I know you're on set shooting with him now, but will you do this? And brilliantly, Craig did. And he put Mitchell on camera and I just went, yep. As soon as I saw it, I went, yep, yep, this is the guy. It was so good. You know, sometimes kids are very natural Yeah. with the emotion. When they grow older, they're not necessarily as good. But that natural ability to just feel pain 
or feel scared or understand that the scary man's coming in and, and, and cry on cue. Mitchell could cry on cue. He understood. He could, he'd said to me at one point, Giles, when do you need me to cry? I went, well, we're gonna, <laughs> on this camera track, we're going to come in here. And I was, I was directing him like I direct an adult, like fully going, on this beat, I want you to think about this. And on this point, this is where the tear's going to come out. And then the man's going to open the door. And that's when you really get scared and get fearful. And he'd go, yeah, no problem. And he'd hit it every time. Well, that's great. And it was, I, you know, we, we totally lucked out with him, totally lucked out. But with the other kids, um, uh, we originally shot with a different set of kids. And they're really? Bulgarian kids. Oh, they lived in Bulgaria, yes. And we rewrote the movie to have more of the kids in for when we did the pickups for the movie. There just wasn't enough flashbacks, and we thought we could get more story here. There's more story. So we decided to recast because we needed them to have more. Um, and it was sad on the kids who were in it originally. Um, I feel bad for them. That's a tough decision to make. It was a tough decision to make, but we had to do it for the good of the film. Yeah, I guess you got to do we that recast sometimes. And we, yeah, um, we, again, the kids we got looked really like the older versions, and they were just amazing. You know, the young girls, she was 10. I had no idea. You know, when you just, I didn't ask her age. I didn't think. And the other kids are all like 12, 13. So they've just got, and she was amazing. Yeah, you know, yeah. just, uh, just mind blowing. So, uh, but it's really, you've got to be really careful with directing kids. You've, you've got to get to their level. You've got to understand and make sure they're aware of what you need from them. Yeah, it's tough. What, I, it's, I, it's, I know. It's difficult. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that uh, you just touched a bit on uh, some reshoots. Um, do you want to talk a bit about that? Like, did you guys start editing? and realize some things weren't working exactly as you needed it? Was this pre-built into the budget? You want to walk us through a bit of that? Yeah, I, I was on set. I was doing um, the one time uh, my exec came on set. It was a brilliant moment because I was really directing Mitchell at that point. I say really directing as if I'm some sort of uh, wanker. But um, <laughs> I happened to be going through a scene with him where I really needed him to do something specific. So I was kept pushing him further and really going yeah Mitch great let's try it this way let's try it that way really to get him to feel the emotion of the scene and it worked at the end of the day we got the performance and we got the shot and it was fantastic and he happened to be stood there watching and he pulled me aside after this scene I went thank fuck he was there for that one <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean but he, he pulled me aside and said Giles what we're going to do is we're going to have two extra pickup days for you I went oh brilliant at the end of you know me what so it's 20 days instead of 18 and he went yeah but you're not going to get them until six months a year later and I went what do you mean I, I need them now we're up against it clock's ticking we've got so much to shoot and he said no no when you edit the movie you'll realize that you need two more pickup days he said you'll just realize I didn't believe him at the time I was like I want them now please let me have them now and he, went, he just laughed at me and went no yeah. <laughs> and just walked off into the into the darkness just disappeared again it was amazing and he was so right once we pieced it all together and sat there in the edit and gone through it all, we needed those pickup days. And he went, no problem, because it's already budgeted. It. I've already given you that time. That's great. Um, it was really interesting because uh, on set, we were tight for time. Like I say, 18 days is, is really difficult to shoot what we had to shoot. And uh, in the movie, there is a lot that takes place in this uh, big warehouse. It's where all the guys get hung upside down uh it's where pigs get cut up it's there's a big fight scene uh the little kid has moments there's there's a lot to shoot big drama scenes the big end um and at first i got told you're gonna have six days to shoot this these all these scenes i was like okay yikes. that's just just about doable yeah yikes just about doable and then they went now you've only got four and I went, oh, how are we going to do this? And they went, this is how you're going to do it. We're going to do it like this. And I went, okay, well, if I move that to that, if I overplan that and I shoot that at the same time as that, maybe we have two teams. Okay, this is possible. This is possible. And then, because I found this amazing set in New Bayana, they'd It's the studio where we shot in Bulgaria. At the time, Antonio Banderas was shooting a movie there. Um, and they'd built this set in one of the studios. And I walked into it and went, oh, my God, this is our set. This is this is this is my farmhouse big. You know, this is the killing floor area I need. And they went, no, you can't have it. I went, please, please. It saves us building one. <laughs> Look at it. Look at it. They're gonna finish. When they're gonna finish? Let's have it. Let's have it. And there was this talk ongoing between this. And obviously, the other company didn't want us to have it. Why would they? It's their set. They built it. Yeah. And eventually, they persuaded them that we could have it, but only at night. 
so this obviously affected our schedule and shooting and how do you now you've got to plan your shoot around a, a night shoot when you've got kids you've got blood you've got all this okay how are we going to do that our headspace shooting at night's a nightmare yeah but come four in the morning you're done and you haven't even halfway through your day someone comes up and goes breakfast and you're like what what are you yeah. talking about ah, it's mental anyway so now the, the the talk goes on and they go we've lost the venue you can't have that venue they won't then they're not going to give you it and i went oh my god how are we going to build one at the time this is in the middle of shooting this is now you know we're a week into shooting and now my brain's going, how are we going to build one? It's, it's, it's going to be impossible. They're like, just use somewhere. I said, it's not going to work. This It looks amazing. You've seen it. It, it looks incredible. It does. It does. Set. Super it's production so value. Good. Yeah, huge production value. It looks like a real warehouse. It's incredible. And eventually they said, okay, you can have this Antonio Banderas set in the night, but for only two nights. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> So now I've got to shoot this, this, all this stuff in two nights. Oh my God. It was, in, it was, it was, I, I said to all my, my crew, I said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to warn you now. This is the two days you're going to get overtime because I'm going to do everything I can to shoot this. And I need you all to be with me and work as fast as you can to get all this done in two days. Oh man. And, and they were amazing and they stuck in and we had crane shots, you know, pulling back with crane shots, big fight scenes, stabbings, killings, someone going in a scolding chamber. You know what I mean? Oh my God. It was insane. It was insane. And we had a lot of problems on those two days. And there's a video of me somewhere I'm on the behind the scenes of me. I'm literally going crazy. I'm literally doing, talking to camera going, I'm going to shoot this. <laughs> I'm going to do this over there. And then later I'm going to do this to there. And I'm going to do this. <laughs> Just my brain was like overflowing with, Oh, how are you going to do this? Because I knew that if I didn't get it, they were tearing it down the next day. They were literally tearing it apart it's over, to make yeah. the yeah. station for the next bit of Antonio's scene. So I had to shoot it in this time. Man, I had that's, to do uh, it. That's a crazy story, man. Yeah. And um, luckily we did. Thankfully we did. I mean, uh, I don't know how, but we got through it. <laughs> we yeah, got through it. <laughs> that's, that's great, man. Though, so, like, uh, that's a triumph and that's a, a credit to you like and what you're right. able to pull off and, and and i'm sure the crew itself too but uh i guess like when you finish something like that did you jump right into editing or did you just like i need to go be alone for a week <laughs> <laughs> like not talk to anyone not think about anything just i need yeah. i need to be alone but like did you have to jump into editing right away or no thankfully and i say this to anyone making a film don't jump into editing straight away don't do it you you you'll hurt yourself you will be in so much pain the best thing to do is go away do yeah. nothing for two weeks a month if you can don't think about the amazing shot that you got don't think about the amazing performance that you got out of someone don't think about any of that because the problem is if you jump straight into editing is that you all you can do is remember the hurt and the pain mm, that you went through yeah. in that particular shot to get it or the performance you got from that take. So you force those into the cut because you went, yeah, but I was crying on that day and the, the, the effort we got to get this shot. Yeah, that's really good advice, actually, yeah. Whereas two, a month later, you've forgotten. Well, you haven't forgotten because, oh, my God, you wake up in cold panic sweats for the next month of going, I should be on set, I should be on set, I missed something, oh, my God. <laughs> it's all, honestly, I had nightmares, nightmares um, because of the pressure and the pain of it all. But, yeah, I, luckily I could give it to my editor and we had someone uh, doing a rough assembly edit during the shooting oh, anyway. Wow. So, so we could see, well, it's a studio. So, of course, they're going to, they want to see the rushes. They want to see it pieced together. Um, they want to make sure you're doing the right things. They don't have to bring someone in to take over. It's their money. They want to make sure it's done right. So they would watch a really, really rough assembly edit. And you, uh, oh my God, when I go in and watch those, sometimes after a day's filming, I'd go in and look and you just go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I don't like it. Because it wasn't your shots. It wasn't how you planned it you know because right. you can overshoot you can overshoot stuff so the editor will just put that together no my advice is walk away just make sure you if there's something you need like an extra hand shot or you haven't got to cut away or the reaction was wrong or the, you shot you crossed the line with the shooting which means someone was looking the wrong way the camera right. wasn't pointing at them in the right angle whatever it is all that kind of stuff be aware of but have a month off and then get your actual editor to do a rough uh, you know his first pass 
sit down and watch that. And even then, it will be the worst thing you've ever seen. Yeah, but no sound yourself. effects, I'm sure. No right? sounds, the grades and all over the place. There's, uh, there's booms in shot, there's performances all over. Be prepared for it to be the worst thing you've ever seen. And be prepared to say to yourself, oh my God, I should quit now. Yeah. That's fine, that's normal. I accept that is normal. <laughs> Everyone I, says I can never go back to Bulgaria. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it, I can't show my face, yeah. all this kind of stuff. You'll be fine once so, you've gone through it brushes you'll you'll be fine you um you had an editor on this uh, but did you take this back to the uk to edit or was this uh, all was all the post done as well in bulgaria or um no i took it back to the uk i amazingly got my wonderful editor oliver parker involved and the studio said yes so it w was great because it meant i could be back in the uk for a good couple of months editing and then once we'd shown them the rough cut they asked us to come back out there and recut it in Bulgaria in their studio while they were doing uh, effects, VFX, and while they were doing sort of other bits and pieces on the film so that we could piece it all together at the same time. Okay. Um, and then they said, look, we're going to do – what pickups do you think we need? Here's what we think we need. Um, and then we just discussed the best way we could make the film better. And yeah. then we – it took a year before we could do reshoots, um, a whole year. Wow, it was devastating. Yeah, so it's like walk me <laughs> like you, you've been very open about just being going crazy while making this thing, but like, what was that year like? Like, you know, like, are you it working was... on other things? Like, uh, are you having? Do you have like a? I, we didn't get into it too much, but like, are you working like a production day job? Like, I like myself, like I run like a independent sort of. Uh, freelance yeah, you, yeah freelance, freelance business so like if i was yeah. doing your thing like i'd be in between working on you know big corporate gigs but like are you is this your life for one year while you're waiting for this to happen or, or are you just like work if, on this if only now? there was enough money to do that um yes then i would love that to just be that but no i i have to do other things like uh, adverts or brand media or whatever it is i'd, I'd jump into that or i'd produce other movies for other people um so I'd be working on other projects. I'd, I'd had a documentary that just, you know, I was working on. Um, I made a serial killer's guide to life that I produced. So during that first year, I, I jumped in on a load of other films as well. But yes, it's a very difficult time. So it, it was a really tough year because you think you'd finished your movie. You deliver a movie and you're ready for it to be released in your eyes. You know, it's like, this is great. And then they say, no, you, we want you to do the pickups. And the reason why we couldn't do the pickups straight away is because there wasn't a studio space or my actors were on other jobs. Yeah. Um, and to coordinate all that so you weren't, you had, to, you had to do it all at the same time. You know, you couldn't say, okay, well, we'll shoot your bit next week or we'll do your bit. It had to all be a studio space, had to be free. They had to build the sets again. For some reason, they burnt them all, tore them down. <laughs> Except our outside, we had a facade. Um where the kids first see the farmhouse and it was literally one story in the woods and we built up in cgi the whole house um <laughs> oh wow it does look pretty good i will say the cgi it's, looks it's, it's, looks it's good. all right you believe it's a, a house it's not bad yeah. is it it's yeah. really good a great great team on it but this was literally just a blue facade it was just you look, you look at it and you go oh my god and this facade stayed there for three whole years and on the final, because I was doing pickup again, I can go into this story for a while, but we still did the final bit of pickups three years later. Wow. <laughs> yep. And this was just because we couldn't get a shot. We couldn't get, so, uh, and because we'd recast the kids by this point, we're like, right, we need to go and shoot the kids. Did, did and you have when like, we, sorry, go continue. Go, yeah, when we went back for this final bit of facade, we needed the facade three years later and it, we knew it stayed up and trees through storms and snow and everything. And this flimsy piece of, you know, bits of wood. Trees had come down like in the forest and just missed it by inches. It was crazy. <laughs> we went. So I'm there for prep for, for this pickups. I go look at it. It's still there. Great. No problem. The day of shooting comes. We go to it in the morning, full of snow. There is no facade. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Rambo 5 was shooting there and the day before, and they just took it down. <laughs> they really? just didn't have took it down so we had to use green screen amazing amazing so you're just trying to but you go okay where's the door then where's where they're supposed to be looking how are we gonna make oh, the effect? how are they gonna make this totally work you know oh it was crazy so it's it's making a film is it's like i say compromises and battles and overcoming hurdles that yeah. you just didn't 
But yeah, not the first. The first year was hard, but the third year was even harder. When you're talking about the movie you made three years ago, or whatever, and yeah, so, people are going, "Yeah, really? Did you make it? Yeah. Did it really oh, you went to Bulgaria? Oh, yeah. oh, did you? Yeah. Okay, all this, and it's a really tough. It's been really tough. So it's amazing to finally get the dare out and and do do well. Is God? It's uh, yeah. yeah. If, if I it's went to Bulgaria time. for three months and then three years later I didn't have a movie to show for it, I think my girlfriend would think I was having an affair. <laughs> yeah, I told, totally. Oh, that was just the first three months, by the way. I was then, for, you know, I was, I was there for a, another quite a long time after that as well. Yeah. So I'd say nine months in total. Yeah, like you say, your girlfriend would be like, "Sorry, you, with this film you said you made in Bulgaria? Come on." Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but during this time, like three years, did you think like? This is never going to see the light of day. Like they might no, just I, scrap it. And oh, did you always worry about they might just scrap it? But I think once you put so much money into it, and again, it's peanuts compared to what they're paying out for Expendables or whatever. It's nothing. So to them, it is a smaller movie. It is like oh, you're doing that little movie. All right, whatever. And it's really hard to get space it's hard to get the sound team in the big you know theater they've got there um it's hard to get you know the grade done it's hard to get because they're working on big movies it's you know it's hard to export the movie because they're exporting hellboy or you know whatever else they're exporting at the time it's like oh we've got to do the dare okay you know it's not big money for them so they have all the master files there so they i'm assuming mm -hmm. just based on what you said like the, the they have their colorist there they have their entire like sound post-production crew foley sound effects all that like it, it that, that all took place in bulgaria yeah everything's there Didn't so they have the, the studio is amazing it has everything that's that is pretty amazing it's like it's one like universal stop shop. Studios. it's one yeah. stop shop that has everything in it uh so inside so if you're walking around new york set or whatever behind the actual set is offices where they're there doing vfx or they're there you know prepping a movie or it's you know they've got dog handlers whatever it is you know doing stuff in that's the amazing studio. that sounds yeah. so cool it's um, really cool how much input did you have on the sound and, and sound design and, and like did your dp andrew was he able to go there and oversee the grade or was it just kind of like hands off Every- on your no no everything i was very hands-on um and that was amazing the team were so good at sound design i was blown away when i first heard the sound design i literally couldn't believe how good it was and i felt ashamed and like a fraud to go and give them notes (laughs) yeah because it was so good and sometimes i found myself thinking i should probably say something I can't just go, this is really good, guys. You know, so you go, okay, well, let's work. How about if we tweak this a bit more? Oh, that thud's too loud or whatever. I was, I'm very hands-on. I'm a very, I know what I want. I know what I want with the score. I know what I want with the grade. I know how I want it to feel, the emotion, when something should be hitting, when it shouldn't. It's it's my baby. My hands are all over this movie um, from everything. Um, but it, it, the team was so good. You know, um, Mario Grigorov, who did the the music, the the score for it. I mean, just different level. So sitting with him and going through the score in his studio was amazing. You know, they know what they're doing. I just give them so many examples beforehand. This is what I want it to sound like. This is what I want it to feel. Yeah, that's the, I, that's interesting. I, I like to hear about working with composers because because I I do the same and yeah, like I find it's it's like a whole other level of your film that. <laughs> You know, I just, I feel like this is just my opinion, but whenever I hear the score, sometimes I'm like, oh, now it's a movie. Like now it feels real. You know? Yes. Yeah. And when those two things go on together, when you get the, the mix back and you hear the score blended in with the sound bed of a bass or a just as a hum, and then you get the score gently coming in and they've, yeah. they've mixed it like a dream. And you put that on with your picture. And then the grade on top of that, oh, it's yeah. like watching a new movie. It's yeah. like someone's redone your movie and just giving it the best polish. I mean, they're the best jobs in the world, right? The colorist and the sound design can be the best job because they're literally making your movie that you've sat and watched for the last, and for me, in my case, three years of watching the same shots, the dog shot, how am I going to pull the light? I can't see their eyes because yeah. whatever happened on the day. And they just go, no problem. And you go, you're my hero. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but... Uh to get through an edit sometimes without sound effects, I, I will inevitably start making the sounds myself to just be mm. like, to just get it to work in your head, especially if you have anything with gun sounds or I don't know, stabbing, anything like that. It's like only until after the sounds go in that you feel like an edit might actually work. 
I, yeah. yeah, we'll just, we'll watch stuff back and we'll, my, the other producer I work with, we'll just end up making the sounds ourselves like acapella. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. it's silly. You would never want to show that to anybody or show that to a client, but for you, you're like, Oh, I know once we put the sound in these edits will sell. So totally. Yeah. Me and Ollie did that. Ollie would do sounds himself. We'd make noises over the mic. I would do all the voices where I needed ADR you know, and try and do the best impression, do a Richard Brake impression. You know, you do, you do whatever you could to, to go, let's try and make this real. And interestingly, on Arthur and Merlin, uh, I did a lot of the voices, which is my, my last movie that's just come out. And I would do, I did a load of voices for the ADR. And because the trailer had to be cut for Berlin Film Festival, an early version was given to them. Uh, where my voice was playing a lot of the characters and they didn't notice <laughs> that I, oh, really? my voice was clearly in the trailer, like massively being someone else's voice. It was like, uh, did you not notice that? So, you know, it's, it's quite amazing what you can get away with. I think. Oh, that's great. Just don't notice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's so important to put those sounds on. You've got to make yourself when you're watching it, not jar. So yeah. I don't like to hear a click or a, uh, you know, if a, if a cut doesn't feel right, I make all that smooth with, we put sound effects on. Ollie was amazing at doing that. Oliver Parker, just putting those sound effects on so that the edit felt real to us. Uh, that's great, man. Uh, I wanted to shift a bit and, uh, obviously you spent a lot of time in post, but I wanted to talk a bit about the marketing of the film and uh, mm. what the, I guess, the studio's approach was for that If and what your approach is. Obviously, you're doing podcasts and you do your own podcast. But, uh, yeah, mm. like, what's the uh, the approach for marketing? I, I know you guys have pretty active social media from, from what I follow. Um, but, like, how do you get the word out about something like this? I think it's so important that if you're a filmmaker to – get the word out yourself um don't rely or trust on anyone else that they're going to do it for you um the studio kind of they they pass it on to the distributors which were the horror collective in the usa and canada and north america um and the horror collective were amazing they just did we did clips so i cut down a load of clips uh um we did you know, images and gave them all to the cast and said, please post these, do articles, try and get um, uh, like a special, uh, uh, whatever it is. Um, uh, um, like a publicist say, or do you guys have a yeah, publicist on it? Or? Sort of, but I, yes, you can have a publicist in the UK now with the dare coming out on October 5th, we've got a publicist and they are doing extra PR for it. So they'll be pushing out to do interviews and stuff like that with the crew. But in the, in America, we did it all ourselves through the horror collective. They did it. So we became our own PR machine of how we can sell this movie. But the sad thing was we were about to have a premiere and COVID started. Yeah. So we couldn't have the premiere and now it's coming out in the UK in a week or whatever it is. And we can't have a premiere because of COVID. So it's killed me really all yeah. this four years of work. Well, six, if you go back from when I first came up with the idea and wrote it and spent time and blood, sweat and tears to not have all your cast and crew come around and watch that and do a really nice, Hey, look, we did something. That is brutal, it, man. It, it's, I, heartbreaking. Yeah. it's heartbreaking. Um, it kind of heals it a little. So maybe we can shift and talk a bit about, about the, that and the distribution too. Like, uh, obviously COVID killed a lot of stuff and that's been a topic of conversation with uh, other filmmakers on the podcast. So just decisions to release during COVID, yay or nay and, and mm -hmm. all that. But, uh, I, I, I'm interested in a lot of stuff, but, the let's go back up a bit and talk about the distribution. Did the studio have stuff in mind? Obviously you had millennium, which is huge and, mm -hmm. uh, releasing stuff in the horror collective. I don't know if you want to talk a bit about, those different deals. And I, th I think I saw on your Facebook too, that Lionsgate is releasing it in the UK. Yes, that's correct. That's amazing. That's, that's a huge, huge thing. But, uh, yeah. I don't know if you wanted yeah. to get into any specifics, details, how that stuff goes about. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm over the moon with, with the distribution we've got on the movie. Uh, like I say, it's low budget. It's amazing. It's just some idea I had in this room and now people can watch it around the world. It's just, it, honestly, it means so much to me. Um, but I was invited to take the film to Popcorn Frights Film Festival. Oh, yeah. And Popcorn Frights is amazing. It's a brilliant horror film festival. Um, and I spoke to the studio. I spoke to Millennium. I spoke to my execs and said, look, can we do this? Because you guys are, 
yeah, it's not on your radar. You don't know I mean, can I move this forward a little bit? Can we go do this? And they went, look, sure, go do what you want. And I was like, okay, great. So we premiered at Popcorn Frights, which was just an amazing experience. Real horror fans who really enjoyed the movie. That's you know, great. What year a- did you uh, screen there? I had a short that screened there. last year. Okay, yeah, last- I had a short that screened there last year. I wasn't there, but... But, oh, amazing! What uh, yeah. was your short? It's called oh, Getting Away. It. it was like uh, it's uh, it's low budget. We made it for like eight hundred bucks, but we amazing. Uh, yeah, but like oh, yeah, we did okay. It's I don't know. There's something about it. Just it keeps getting into festivals places. So that's yeah. really good. Well yeah, done. That's yeah. funny, and it's amazing. It's honestly, it's worth going. Yeah, they're yeah. so good to filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Um, and small yeah, world. you never know what to you, it is yeah this world is indie film world is a small world yeah. but you never know what you're going to expect to get from a film festival like this but they had some really cool people there you know there's dread central and uh, daily dread daily dead and all these people were there and you know like okay what's happening this is really cool there's some good people and uh, jonathan from um well, he's at the horror collective now he was at dread central he said to me he turned around and said hey i Hey, you'll film the dares playing tomorrow and i went yeah hey it's mate how you doing all right he said yeah yeah i'm looking forward to watching that i said great really cool he said cool yeah yeah let's talk so after the screening um he came up and talked to me and he said yeah look we think this could be a horror collective vibe we really like it can i give it to the rest of my team at the horror collective and i said of course you can absolutely uh and he did and he, he sent it back to the team and they got back in touch and said yeah look we'd really like to distribute this movie be make it one of our first you know off the new horror collective because uh Shaked, who was at epic films moved across to form the horror collective so i set it up with millennium i said to millennium look i've got the horror collective they'd really like to distribute the movie in america can we make this happen and we made it happen. And that was really cool. And if I hadn't have got the call from the Popcorn Frights, if I hadn't gone there, who knows where we'd be right now? Who knows it would have the buzz it's had? Um, yeah, that's great. I don't know. And the same with the same with Lionsgate. Lionsgate well, it mainly came through all the buzz that was happening with Popcorn and with the Horror Collective. And they got in touch with, uh, with uh, Millennium because of it and said, can we talk about this? Um, and yeah, and suddenly Lionsgate picked it up. And that's wonderful. So it is all about putting yourself out there and going to these festivals. If I hadn't been there, would it have got picked up? I don't know is the answer. Maybe yeah. not. Man, that, so, that's, that's great. It, and, and congrats to you for, for all that. Did you guys do uh, much other festivals or did you? No, no. We did, we did a couple of others, but I just... I didn't push it into too many because I didn't know. Millennium weren't going, oh, well, we want to do the festival route. It was very much like, no, we we think this could be cool without doing it that angle. But Panic Fest asked us to go there, and I said, yeah, yeah, let's go in Panic Fest. So we went to Panic Fest as well. Um, I, festivals are amazing. Yeah. You meet just really cool people and filmmakers, and you see other films, and you go, oh, okay, that's why this got in. Ah, that's why this one's going to do well, and this yeah. one's not. Um, and if you have a name in your movie, like Richard Brake or, you know, um, uh, Elijah Wood, you're going to get in festivals you know what yeah. I mean? because they think these people might turn up and they often do. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference to their festival. So uh, it's worth pushing and fighting for it. Yeah. I, I go back and forth and I have different discussions with different filmmakers about it and the pros and cons of a festival and, you know, the cost of submitting to all these different festivals and not knowing if you get in and, you know, doing the work too to try and put butts in seats at these festivals too is a whole other thing. So I go back and forth. I've had success with with some films, and I've had you know not less success with other films getting them in festivals. But yeah, I I do agree. It is nice to network and talk to people at these festivals, and obviously COVID's made that way more difficult now. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah. It's uh, it is interesting. I, I have noticed there's a bigger community around horror than there is around other genres. But yeah, that's that that is that is something that's kind of cool. Um, so I uh, I try you you were talking a bit uh, I think before that uh, you'd listened to some previous episodes. So I had the the series of questions I asked the last time I did one of these interviews, and I thought I'd I'd run through it with you as well. And uh, and tr- I'm gonna try and ask all the guests the guests these questions. So uh, you're round two of these questions, all right? <laughs> okay. Um, so 
something uh, about the the film industry uh, that was a mystery like you didn't understand it uh, but now you now that you're in the business you understand it i wonder if you could talk a bit about something like that and then something that's still a mystery about the film industry to you yeah great question i think before i started making movies i didn't really understand what went into it and i thought you can make a movie and why you know and get it out there in the world and surely everyone's just going to like it and why can't our film be the next you know uh full monty or billy elliot or blair witch uh, look the likelihood is now knowing what i know almost impossible you need so many things to go right your movie has to be the best in the world to get through the noise because there's so many other films get released constantly so before i started that was something i thought you know you didn't realize what went into a movie you didn't realize how hard it was and how many hoops you have to dr- jump through and how much you have to compromise i think i i, I learned so much about myself but also about filmmaking and how important it is and i touched on this before about knowing who your audience is from the get-go like i say don't try and make a drama you know with no names in it or you can but know that mm, you, you, you might get your mum to watch it you know be honest <laughs> about that it's true yeah. don't put your house on it yeah because why should a distributor spend their time and money put you know trying to get people to watch your film when they've got a film with nicholas cage over there yeah yeah do you see what i mean so you've really got to think about it you know go make it for 50 grand if you want it's your money whatever you're not thinking or make it for five grand but don't expect it to be massive just expect to you know it some of your friends might watch it you might get lucky and get a few festivals because it's it's a really, really difficult business. I've been really lucky. Um, there's no question about it. I mean, I work for that luck, believe me, you know, to get Millennium on board, to get Studio involved in the first place. It's a luck of knowing Julian. It's a luck of writing something that was commercial enough that they would take a punt on. Yeah. You know, all those things. It's like They're the never... saying the 10, 10 years of hard work for one day of good luck, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's very and true. And that's, that's the truth. So yeah. the more, the harder you work, the luckier you become yeah and that that is true um do, is there anything still mystifying about this world yeah <laughs> it's like unlimited uh, things but it's something that might yeah. just come to come to your head right now yeah i think i think it's still why films get made and how it actually happens because it's still amazing it's a miracle anything gets made it yeah it really is I feel the same way. It's like, how did that, why? And then Mm -hmm. there's other stuff you're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense how that got made. But yes. And then, yeah. Even even then, you know, they needed, they needed um, Ryan Reynolds to say yes. At that point, happened to be free, you know, was whatever, his his wife had just given birth and it meant that they needed needed to be at home and he was filming right near his house. Whatever it is, all those things come into play. Yeah. And it is a miracle you can get a film over the line and released into the world. So I'm, you know, my thing is always now I look at other movies, no matter how bad they, I think they are. I realize how much went into them, how difficult it was for that filmmaker to make it, how many problems he or she might have had on set. You know, all these things can go wrong. So when you're watching a movie now, is it, you look at all that yeah. and you go, yeah, okay. You know, even if, if my missus or kids are going, oh, you know, no, it's a bit shit. You go, okay, well, why? What happened? Because don't forget, this might have happened. There was a major issue with the, the screenwriter or whatever, or the studio wanted to cut a load of stuff, or the actor didn't want to be in it anymore, and you had to work around it. Or they just didn't All have money. Things. That's what I find. Yeah, it's just didn't like, have money. You know, you didn't have money to do it. And people, the, the sad thing is when people watch movies now is they compare your movie to a huge budget movie. Exactly. Yeah. They don't see any difference. They just go, oh, it's a bit shit and cheap, whatever. They don't get that it actually was cheaper. They don't get that, you, you yeah. know, they, think they don't know shit. everything that went into making it. And I, and I guess at the end of the day, I guess it shouldn't matter. And you, we have to figure out how to compete with, with something like that. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's like, if you only knew how hard it was to do this, you know, 
but yeah, you I would know. be so much more impressed. <laughs> uh, yes, well, you would be. Yeah, they'd be like, oh, my God, you did that. You went through that and you still delivered this. <gasps> you hero, but they don't. They yeah. literally go online and go, hey, this was a bit crap. Didn't like it. Oh, the mask was stupid. Why yeah. did they run into the basement? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, it's a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. We've done, uh, I've, had, I've done screenings in the past, just small, small ones, but we put, because it was in a bar, we put uh, an intermission in. Um, mm. for people to buy more booze and, and whatever. Yes, we have a drinking idea. game associated with it. But um, we uh, we put uh, one of the clips of the behind the scenes in that intermission. So if people were, you know, mulling about, we would put, they would have like 10 minutes of uh, a behind the scenes clip. And all the time, like the start, they might not have been as interested, but as soon as they saw like, oh shit, like this was made for almost no money and it was made in this bar maybe that I, w- I was in, in one of the circumstances, but like, yeah, that went a long way for us, but obviously you can't do that with a feature production or something like that, but no. it, it did go a long way. And then there was a lot more questions around it after, and there was a little bit more praise, but it takes putting in that 10 minutes of behind the scenes. Yes, it does. Uh, it does. Moving along the question list, um, some advice. I, I know this is something like I'll oh, give advice for other people, but uh, I want to spin it a bit and just say some advice for your former self. Like, what, what would you have told yourself 10 years ago or 20 years ago? I'd have said, don't worry so much. Yeah. Don't panic. If, and I'd have said to myself, get rid of those people. Ignore that producer. Tell him to go do one now. Be confident in what you have and your own ability rather than being worried about it and relying on other people to do the work or pretend they're doing the work. And when I first started, I was so scared of losing out. Or, you know, if we found a producer who was rubbish or an asshole, you would hang on because you thought, yeah, but, you know, it, it's a chance and they're talking a good game, you know? I'd, I'd say to that, my younger Giles now, um, I'd say, get rid of them. Not move on. You don't need them. Yeah, and th- yeah. that's the truth. I don't need them. Um, I definitely do that and be brave. I know that y- it's okay. I was so panicked when I started shooting the day. I was so in my own sort of head of, I have to prove, I have to be good. I have to do this right. I was already doing it right. I was already on the right path. Trust in your ability and just make it work rather than, I was so panicked. You know, movies I've made since, I've I've now not so panicked. I make sure I do the work, but I know that I can do it. So therefore I'm not so worried. So maybe I would have told myself that. I don't know, or maybe it worked because I was panicked. And I say panicked in the right way. I was still very focused, I think. Um, Yeah. It takes yeah, that though. That. You gotta, you gotta get wet. You gotta get hit in the face once before you, you know, you go yes. at it, sort type thing. You know. Yeah. Um, so, so I know a lot of people talk about their like to talk about success, and you've been actually very open in talking about success, failures, and how you feel vulnerable. And I and I will say it is it is refreshing to hear you. I do hear that a lot of just people talk talking up a, a strong game, but you know. Really, it's not the case behind the scenes, but uh, I was curious to know about just some failures in the business, you know, and we, we mm. often like to talk about our successes, but there are those failures that are big learning experiences. Yeah, yeah, a lot of failures um, in filmmaking. There's so many, and without them, I wouldn't have been able to make movies. And again, it touched on something I said before about working with the wrong people and trusting the wrong people, a huge failure. It massive, it's a waste of two years, three years of my life when you're relying on other people. When yeah. actually I could have gone off and done this on my own, but I was so scared of doing that, I was so scared. So my thing now is find the right people, find those people who you believe in, who are as passionate as you. And if there's any doubt creeps in, just go, no, nah, this might not be right. It doesn't matter how much you've worked on the project, if it's going to be so much pain, then yeah, it's maybe not right. But failures, I think, can come from not prepping correctly, not mm, writing mm. something correctly, spending months, you know, screenwriting on a project that I hadn't th- fully thought through. I didn't have an ending. So therefore, suddenly I'm 120 pages in and really I'm not even at the you know, second act. And it's like, well, what are you doing? And then that just gets lost. Um, yeah. So I've learned to prep and be very cautious of who I work with um I've also jumped in with two feet and it's worked brilliantly but 
uh, sometimes it hasn't. So it's just trusting your gut and understanding you and being and uh, believing in your own ability. But uh, yeah, those failures came from me not being strong enough. Um, and there's been lots, so many times. Uh, we had we had some big names attached to projects, and I believed in the people who were telling me they were attached. And now looking back. I don't think they were ever really attached. I think it was just a total lie spun out to keep them on the project more that they could spin to another production to try and get some money to say, hey, we've got so-and-so on right, this project. Yes. There's so much of that goes on. So it's just That's being brutal. really wary when you're starting. And, and and my advice as well would be if you can go out and make your own film where you don't need anyone else's money or help, go shoot it. Because the one reason I couldn't make a film for so long is because I hadn't made a movie it didn't matter how terrible the movie would be I'd made before. The fact that I'd been through the trenches, that I'd understood the beginning, middle and the end of a movie. I'd worked with crews, teams and actors for at least two weeks. And when you've done that and you're knackered and you can still do it, I trust you to go make another one. Yeah, That's fact. People yeah. always get hung up on their first movie. It has to be massive. It has to be a huge breakout hit. No, it doesn't. You just, if you want to be a director and a filmmaker, go be a director and filmmaker. Don't worry about trying to follow, you know, Spielberg's path or Nolan's path. Follow your own path and be brave and go, all right, my first movie wasn't great. It didn't make money, but so what? I made it for 500 quid in my basement. Look what I could do with some money. Come on. Yeah. That's your power. That's your strength. And the people who come to me now who've made a movie for nothing and they go, oh, it's terrible. I, re- I trust them so much more than someone who hasn't made a movie because they've done it. They've yeah. literally taken the plunge and failed and then gone, right, I'm now ready. I've learned from that. I'm yeah. better. No, I, man, I, I can speak to that too. Yeah. Cause I, I I've done it. I've done it twice on, on a low budget scale too. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, the next thing up, uh, I'll, I'll for, first I'll say that's all great advice and that, um, and that I, I, I'm hearing a lot of myself through you and, and stuff I say too. <laughs> and, uh, I think it, I think it's all relevant, and I think it's all really, really, really great stuff. Um, I I think we could do this conversation forever, but uh, I uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was curious to know what you have next. I, I know uh, going by your IMDb, you got a lot of stuff on on there, and I see uh, the Arthur and Merlin uh, Arthur and Merlin Knights uh, is coming out or is out now or. It's out in the UK now. It's out in North America in December. So that's a historical action movie that we shot uh, in November last year in Wales in the rain. <laughs> it rained every day. Uh, it made it part of the movie, you know. It's very much swords and sandals type movie, but it's, <laughs> also, it's, but it's more of a drama. You know, it's more of a drama. It's Arthur's quest going back to Camelot. And what he now is a much older Arthur, if you like, than most Arthurs around, has to work out what what his what his purpose is he doesn't want to be a king but in the end he realizes he was supposed to be the king so it's it's a nice take on it it's you know it's a fun movie but it's dark (laughs) and i had a great time making it um so yeah that's out now um i'm working on a shakespeare adaptation um i've got a call about in a minute um that we're hopefully shooting in texas uh, next year i've got a horror comedy that we're hopefully shooting in the beginning of next year um Again, it's all talk. I'm also writing a few projects with a few people that I'm really happy about and excited about. But again, all of them could fall down at any minute. I've been here before many times. I'm just in a better position because I have made movies. It just puts you in a better stead. It's more likely that the investor trusts in you and the producers trust in you. And you're saying what you can do because it's on the tin. Check out the day. You can see it. I've done that movie. I've done Uh, you know i've been in the trenches i've done it and that really puts you in good stead so fingers crossed some of those happen but yeah i'm loving it um i'm loving creating and making films it's a great place to be yeah would you attribute the dare to the you know your current success being able to do you know the arthur movie and being able to do all these other things or yep. yeah it's just like that was your one 100%. that was the foot yeah in the door. 100 it doesn't matter how good or bad it is the fact is i made it uh you know i got arthur and merlin based on my pitch and how i again i did the same thing really you know did a, a rip reel and everything um but also because i'd made a movie i don't think they'd seen it but the fact that they knew i'd made a movie that millennium had picked up uh, and that was distributed through the horror collective and lionsgate they went oh, okay cool 
you know what you're doing. Yeah, and yeah. That's that goes a important. long way. So for a while, I was I could play on the back of hey that you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's cool, but uh, yeah, it does make a difference. Man, that's that's great, and uh, I th- I think it's amazing. I, I think we could do a whole other podcast to talk about Arthur, and maybe I will uh, in, in a in a month or so sure, uh, once I have too. time to check it out. Um, yeah. But uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast, Giles, and uh, sharing so much with us and and peeling back the onions of of making something like the Dare and uh, really showing us like everything that goes into it, not just like filmmaking, but emotionally in making something like that and, and the ups and downs of making something over, you know, a super long time and all that goes into it, blood, sweat, tears, time, energy, and for it to come out, I, I share your sentiment and just for people to watch it, you know, on the other side of the world, it is special. So uh, congrats to you for making it and congrats on all your, on all your current success, sir. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate you chatting to me and uh, some great questions. Thank you, buddy. No worries. And again, The Dare is on Amazon and iTunes in North America, and it's coming out in the UK on uh, October 5th. So keep an eye out for that. There is a few spoilers in the podcast, but I encourage you to check it out. Game over, man. Game over. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at Lost Commentary, on Instagram at Raiders of the Lost Commentary, and like us on Facebook. I'll be back.